Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome along. Thank you, Warwick. Good to see you. Um, thanks to all those who brought dinner. Uh, that was magnificent. Um, and we'll have a break uh, after the first talk and have 15 minutes. The urn's on. There's some cakes and some biscuits. Um, thank you for coming along tonight. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, to do fellowship together midweek. Uh, someone was saying to me uh, today that even one of the school car parks was a buzz at the fact that people could see each other at church during the week. And I think that's just a delight. Uh, let me invite Ian up. Uh, why don't we make Ian feel welcome? Uh, some of you uh, have met Ian. Uh, we met Ian two years ago and he did something very similar. They were quite memorable talks and uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, it's a good welcome to uh, Lockie and Phoebe as well. The cakes you will have at supper were cooked by them this afternoon. Uh, so make sure you thank them for that. Uh, Ian, quick few questions, because not all of us were at the teaching weekend uh, two years ago. Uh, family members? Uh, so married to Pam, we've been married for 21 years this year, and we have three kids, two, two of whom uh, are with us yep. this evening, and Silas is our, our youngest. Uh, Pam and Silas are not in the country, is that right? They are. Uh, they arrive on Tuesday. Right. So you spend some of the year uh, in Sydney. Where do you spend the rest of the year? Uh, Western Massachusetts, as we seek to care for two ageing mums right. in their 80s. On different continents. On different continents. Yeah. So yeah. if you want to pray for these guys, pray for them along those lines. Appreciated. Uh, yeah. Ian, uh, when did you meet Jesus? Uh, 1997, when I was at uni. Um, and... Uh, 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 came to the Lord then through the faithful ministry of some friends, um, uh, family, uh, 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 long-time friends of the family as well. And uh, before long, I found my way uh, to St. John's Maroubra, where your dad was the minister and where uh, you yourself very kindly welcomed me into the, into the fold. So... Um, and, and we gave the kids a taste of how we'd spend our time this afternoon, didn't we? Lockie, Phoebe and Baxter playing cricket in the church hall. Uh, there were no broken windows this time. Uh, Ian, uh, you uh, met Jesus then. You taught for a while. Uh, you went to Bible college. Uh, what's the description of your job now? Uh, so for the last 13 years, I've been the head of the Christian Thought Department at Sydney Missionary and Bible College. That basically involves teaching a lot of theology and some church history as well. And getting to, having the privilege of um, be, being a quartermaster in an army, really resourcing the front lines. Um, so stepping off the front lines and um, having the privilege of um, training up um, uh, men and women for servicing God's kingdom in a, in a bunch of different places. And you've done that for us. You did that in 2019 when you led a mission team. That's right. Uh, yeah. We've benefited yeah. long term from that. Yeah. Dan, Sinead, it's good to have you with us because of that. Uh, and you've come back a number of times. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason Ian's here tonight is because he rang me up and said, hey, I'm going to Dubbo. Thought I might come via Narrabri, uh, catch up with you guys and do a few talks. Is that OK? Um, how often do you get that kind of invite? Uh, from someone who knows so much uh, about God's word and God's people. I'm going to pray and then hand over to you. Uh, at the end of Ian's first talk, there'll be an opportunity for questions. Everything's being recorded and will be on our website. Uh, then we'll have a break and then come back for the second talk. Let me pray. Uh, Father, thanks for food. Thanks for heaters. Uh, thank you for fellowship. Thank you for men and women. Thanks for children. Uh, thank you for being a household. Thank you for Ian. Uh, thank you for Pam. Thank you for Lockie, Phoebe and Silas. I thank you for the way in which you've worked in them uh, so that they know and love you because you know and love them. Father, thank you that we can hear about a great man and a great woman from history, uh, sinful, flawed, um, contradictory in many ways, uh, but saved just like us uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, thank you for tonight. Amen. Amen. Well, as Bernard has, uh, has prayed, we're going to learn about our, uh, a founding father and a founding mother of evangelicalism tonight, and uh, both of them are pretty complicated in their own ways. Um, and so we're going to start with uh, the founding father, and that's George Whitfield. Um, uh, so I've entitled this one, Whitfield and Slavery, uh, Lessons for Today from 
early evangelicalism's mixed legacy. Uh, in June 1919, an eight-foot-tall bronze statue of the Reverend George Whitfield was dedicated on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Uh, it was an institution that Whitfield had indirectly helped create with uh, Benjamin Franklin in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, the sculpture visualised Whitfield, um, a, a transatlantic preaching celebrity, uh, and one of the, the founding fathers of the, of the evangelical movement, um, preaching in full dramatic flow. And there's the, uh, there's the statue there, um, clutching a Bible in his left hand and pointing to the heavens with his right as his gown billowed in the wind. Uh, if, you've, if, if you've ever, ever read anything published by the Banner of Truth Trust, uh, you might recognise that image uh, so that image was taken from um, a painting um, done in the mid-19th century um, that was uh, being immortalised in that statue, but also uh, on the spine of books uh, published by the Banner of Truth. Uh, the inscription on this statue uh, emphasises, um, or should I say emphasised, past tense, uh, Whitfield's identity and vocation, a humble disciple of Jesus Christ, and an eloquent preacher of the gospel. Uh, one aspect of Whitfield's life that isn't mentioned on his statue was his enthusiastic support for the introduction of slavery uh, into the colony of Georgia in the 1740s, as well as the fact that he owned slaves himself. Uh, now, fast forward to June 2020, and these skeletons in Whitfield's closet were suddenly thrust into the spotlight when in the midst of a wider national reckoning uh, in the United States surrounding the place of systemic racism in that country, uh, the University of Pennsylvania announced that it was tearing down Whitfield's statue. In a public statement, the university's leadership argued that uh, Whitfield's pro-slavery stance was undeniably one of his principal legacies. They concluded that there is absolutely no justification for having a statue honouring him at Penn. Uh, just a few months later, in September of 2020, uh, the celebrations to commemorate the 250th anniversary of Whitfield's death in Newburyport, Massachusetts, where he's buried, uh, they were quickly recalibrated to factor in his role in perpetuating slavery throughout the British Empire. Uh, Rebranded as the Great Awakening meets a just awakening, uh, the event sought to honour uh, Whitfield's legacy as a life-changing, history-making evangelist, but in such a way as to also acknowledge that his advocacy of slavery was tragically inconsistent with his message of the gospel's radical inclusivity. All of which begs the question, what on earth do we now do with George Whitfield? For so long venerated as an evangelical hero, um, a role model of warm-hearted Calvinism and evangelistic zeal. Have we unwittingly been celebrating a villain this whole time? So to cancel or not to cancel George, uh, that's the question. Uh, that's ahead of us tonight. Now, it's worth noting at the outset that as far back as his own lifetime, people have been wanting to cancel Whitfield for his views on slavery, that though for very different reasons compared to today. Uh, back in 1740, uh, during his first trailblazing preaching tour of the American colonies, Whitfield took aim at uh, southern... American slave owners, and he criticised them, not, not for owning slaves per se, he, he demurred on that question at, at, that, at that point, but instead he criticised them for the barbaric way that they treated their slaves. Quote, God has a quarrel with you for your abuse and cruelty to the poor Negroes, he wrote in a lengthy public letter that he directed at slave masters in the southern states of Maryland and Virginia and the Carolinas. 
Uh, in a society where slaves were typically viewed as having uh, more worth than creatures, but less worth than white people, Whitfield accused his readers of oppressing those who, quote, work as hard, if not harder, than the horses you ride. Your dogs are cared for and fondled at your tables, but your slaves, who are frequently styled dogs or beasts, have not an equal privilege. They are scarce permitted to pick up the crumbs which fall from their master's tables. Worse, slave masters added physical abuse to their neglect. Some, as I've been informed by an eyewitness, have been upon the most trifling provocation, cut with knives and have had forks thrown into their flesh, Whitfield wrote. Given all this, he poignantly wondered that we have not more instances of self-murder among the Negroes or that they have not more frequently risen up in arms against their owners. And yet, tellingly, there were limits to Whitfield's empathy. Now, perhaps sensing at this point in his letter that his readers might suspect him of promoting an abolitionist agenda, Whitfield's courage and sympathy faltered, and he made it very clear that he still supported the institutional status quo. Slave abuse was bad, but he nevertheless prayed that slaves may never be permitted to get the upper hand. Though he did add, poignantly, uh, poignantly given the recent slave rebellion in Stono, South Carolina, in September 1739, that, quote, should such a thing be permitted by providence, all good men must acknowledge that judgment would be just. Even more serious, in Whitfield's view, was the way that slave masters neglected their slaves spiritually. Enslaving or misusing their bodies, comparatively speaking, would be an inconsiderable evil was proper care taken of their souls, he rebuked. He urged slave masters to view slaves as fellow image bearers of God, a self-evident statement to our ears, but not so much back then. Blacks are just as much and no more conceived and born in sin as white men are, he wrote. I'm apt to think that whenever the gospel is preached with power amongst them, that many will be brought effectually home to God. But suppose they did become Christians. Wouldn't this experience of spiritual liberation translate into an appetite for physical liberation, rebellion? Whitfield responded, I challenge the world to produce a single instance of a Negro's being made a thorough Christian and thereby made a worse servant. It cannot be, he argued. In other words, when Whitfield read the Bible, he saw it supporting and conserving 18th century social structures, not challenging them. Uh, when it came to reaching America's black slave population with the gospel, Whitfield practiced what he preached. In one really famous sermon he preached in uh, 1740 called The Lord Our Righteousness, uh, he applied his message at the end. He was very fond of applying uh, uh, his sermons to uh, separate um, uh, constituencies, demographics within his um, audience. Uh, young men, young maidens, you of a middle-aged, uh, grey-haired sinners, little children. And last but not least, he has a word for slaves. I must not forget the poor Negroes. No, I must not, he concluded. Lest anyone come away thinking that he included them as an afterthought, he said, nor do I mention you last because I despise your souls, but because I would have what I shall say make the deeper impression on your hearts. Not only did he reinforce that Jesus' atoning death was just as much for them as well as for others, Whitfield was adamant that they possessed the same inherent dignity and worth as those who were free. Um, citing Galatians 3.28, he wrote, For in Jesus Christ there is neither male nor female, bond nor free. Even you may be the children of God if you believe in Jesus. Now, meanwhile, uh, Whitfield was also very busy overseeing the construction of an orphanage near Savannah, Georgia, that he called Bethesda. Uh, this project was an economic millstone around his neck from the get-go. Um, and in due course, it would become a moral millstone around his neck as well. Uh, the cost of labour, especially white labour, he specifically pointed out, was prohibitively high in Georgia 
The produce of the land cultivated by white servants will scarcely furnish them with ordinary food and raiment, exclusive of the expenses of sicknesses and wages. I can't see how it's possible for the colony to subsist on its present footing, he wrote. In case readers missed the point, even at this early stage of his philanthropic ministry, Whitfield was crystal clear. Georgia needed to allow slaves if it was going to survive, let alone flourish. As for manuring more land than the hired servants can manage, I think it is impracticable without a few Negroes. It will in no wise answer the expense. Now, in contrast to their neighbours in South Carolina, just to the, to the north of Georgia, uh, Georgia was established in the 1730s as a slave-free colony. Now, it has to be noted that wasn't because of any enlightened abolitionist convictions um, that, they, that they had, but instead because they feared that having slaves jeopardised the colony's ability to defend itself against foreign invasion, uh, especially with the Spanish lurking to the south down in, down in Florida. Uh, quote, experience has shown that the manner of settling colonies and plantations with black slaves has obstructed the increase of English and Christian inhabitants therein, who alone can, in case of a war, be relied on for the defence and security of the same. That's a quote from the legislation, the 1735 legislation um, uh, uh, for the formation of this colony in, in Georgia. Uh, that being said, public opinion was always against the Georgia trustees' legislation. If the colony was going to survive economically, argued white business owners, it needed to embrace slavery. And so between 1735, when this colony was, uh, was started, and 1750, for that 15-year period, hundreds of petitions and reports crossed the Atlantic to the point that the House of Commons in London began to lose patience with the trustees' ability to manage this colony. Throughout the 1740s, Whitfield added his voice to this persistently shrill chorus advocating for the reversal of the 1735 Act. As we've seen, he'd never been wholly averse to the practice of slavery, just only its excesses and its abuses. But now, as the 1740s progressed, and as Bethesda's financial fortunes hung in the balance, he became more convinced of its necessity. Up until this point, Whitfield had resisted becoming a slave master himself. But in 1747, even this changed. He bought a plantation in next door South Carolina that he named Providence, maybe, I suspect, an effort on his part to baptise this venture with uh, divine blessing. Securing the long-term economic stability of Bethesda was paramount in making this decision. And so justifying his momentous choice as the product of Georgia's very bad constitution, he wrote that God has put it into the hearts of my South Carolina friends to contribute liberally towards purchasing a plantation of slaves in this province, which I purpose to devote to the support of Bethesda. Bought at a very cheap rate, the plantation consisted of 640 acres of excellent land. And then in almost an aside, he added faithfully, one Negro has been given to me. Now, there weren't many who were prepared to uh, oppose slavery during the first half of the 18th century, but they did exist. And some of them knew Whitfield personally, and they even tried to steer him away from this practice. One vocal critic uh, of uh, Whitfield's pro-slavery trajectory uh, was the French-American Quaker and abolitionist Anthony Benezet. Uh, in 1775, um, five years after Whitfield had died, uh, he wrote to Selina, Countess of Huntington, we're going to learn a little more about her later on this evening, uh, he wrote to her offering a candid explanation for this migration in Whitfield's attitude towards slavery. Uh, quote, he at first clearly saw the iniquity of this horrible abuse of the human race, as manifestly appears in the letter he published on that subject. I alluded to that um, earlier this evening, that letter. Uh, but Whitfield's relative clarity of moral vision 
had become dulled over time, suggested Benazet. After residing in Georgia and being habituated to the sight and use of slaves, his judgment became so much influenced as to defend the use of slaves. This was a matter of much concern to me and which I repeatedly, with brotherly freedom, expressed to him. In other words, the more Whitfield experienced this peculiar institution firsthand and became dependent on its fruits, argued Benazet, the more accepting that he became of it. Well, Whitfield brushed off Benazet's entreaties and on December 6, 1748, he appealed to the trustees, no doubt aware of the political clout that he exerted. Uh, by, by this stage, the orphanage was the colony's largest civil employer, providing jobs, education, and religious services for Georgians. Quote, I need not inform you, honoured gentlemen, how the colony of Georgia has been declining for these many years last past, and at what great disadvantages I have maintained a large family in that wilderness. Once more, he laid out not only his allegiance to the colony, but also what he saw as the roadblocks that they were putting in his path. Upwards of £5,000 have been expended in that undertaking, and yet very little proficiency made in the cultivation of my tract of land, and that entirely owing to the necessity I lay under of making use of white hands. Whitfield's proposed solution was simple. Quote, had a Negro been allowed, I should now have had a sufficiency to support a great many orphans without expending above half the sum which has been laid out. He was quick to contrast Bethesda's financial struggles with the success of his plantation in South Carolina, where Negroes are allowed. Even though I have only eight working hands, he explained, yet in all probability there will be more raised in one year and with a quarter of the expense than has been produced at Bethesda for several years past. He was willing to comply with the current legislation as long as it remained in place. I'm determined that not one of my slaves shall ever be allowed to work at the orphan house till it can be done in a legal manner, he wrote. But all of this professed loyalty aside, he also issued a scarcely veiled threat that unless the trustees altered their legislation, he'd be forced to seriously consider moving his business elsewhere, uh, that elsewhere being neighbouring South Carolina. Quote, I'm as willing as ever to do all I can for Georgia and the orphan house if either a limited use of Negroes is approved of or some more indented servants sent over. If not, I cannot promise to keep any large family or cultivate the plantation in any considerable manner. My strength must necessarily be taken to the other side, he wrote, the other side being South Carolina. It's hard to say how decisive Whitfield's lobbying proved to be in the trustees' decision to eventually change course and allow slavery. What is clear is that when that legislation was formally overturned on the 1st of January, 1751, Whitfield celebrated the news as a mark of divine blessing. Quote, thanks be to God that the time for favouring that colony seems to be come. I think now is the season for us to exert our utmost for the good of the poor Ethiopians. We are told that even they are soon to stretch out their hands unto God. And who knows, but their being settled in Georgia may be overruled for this great end. A decade earlier, he'd balked at saying whether he thought the Bible endorsed slavery or not. But now, and coinciding with his freedom to introduce slaves onto his land, Whitfield was ready to declare his hand. Quote, as for the lawfulness of keeping slaves, I have no doubt. As always, his instinct was to go to the Bible to justify his actions. And so he interpreted examples of slavery in the Old and New Testament as proof that not only did the scriptures describe the institution as it occurred in the ancient world, they also prescribed its continuation in his own time and place. In the decades following Whitfield's death, evangelicals like Wesley and Newton and Wilberforce pushed back on Whitfield's interpretation of the Bible. But it has to be said that Whitfield's position wasn't unusual amongst evangelicals during his lifetime. 
In fact, his beliefs were by and large the norm, shared by other first-generation evangelicals like no less than Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Edwards and Whitfield shared lots in common theologically, um, and they shared lots in common also when it came to slavery. Both believed that although the slave trade was immoral because it violated the injunction against men's dealers in 1 Timothy 1, slave owning itself wasn't prohibited in Scripture. Conceding that, quote, they are brought in a wrong way from their own country and it's a trade not to be approved of, in Whitfield's thinking, slavery was a God-ordained, unalterable fact of life in uh, the 18th century uh, British Empire. Quote, let us reason no more about it, but diligently improve the present opportunity for their instruction, he wrote. As an evangelist, he saw his role as helping to redeem slavery, not abolish it. And what better way to do so, he figured, than as a slave master himself and not as a mere observer. Yet as it will be carried on whether we will or not, he rationalised, I should think myself highly favoured if I could purchase a good number of them in order to make their lives comfortable and lay a foundation for breeding up their posterity in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The prospect of evangelising slaves might have excited Whitfield, but without doubt, the financial incentives that came with slavery were never far from his mind. With breathtaking callousness, he casually speculated that, quote, though liberty is a sweet thing to such as are born free, yet to those who never knew the sweets of it, slavery, perhaps, may not be so irksome. It's plain that hot countries cannot be cultivated with Negroes, he wrote, lamenting the profligate wastage of lives, white lives, in language that betrayed his default sense of racial superiority. What a flourishing country might Georgia have been had the use of them been permitted years ago. How many white people have been destroyed for want of them? And how many thousands of pounds spent to no purpose at all? In many ways, Whitfield was a product of his 18th century transatlantic time and place. Like all of us, he was unavoidably influenced without being inevitably determined by the prevailing attitudes and assumptions of the world that he lived in. Like all of us, he was also full of morally culpable blind spots and contradictions. He embodied these especially vividly when it came to his involvement with slavery, one of the most ubiquitous features of life in the British Empire. He endorsed it and indeed expanded it, while also working to improve it in keeping with his view that it could function as a Christian institution. But while Whitfield devoted his life to proclaiming the good news of liberation from bondage to sin and death and the devil in the spiritual realm for both black and white, this concern for the liberty of slave souls never translated into advocating for their physical freedom. On some level, and at certain moments, he seemed to grasp that extolling the former without the latter entailed profound contradiction. For instance, in the spring of 1748, he made a two-month-long evangelistic side tour to Bermuda. He had especially high hopes of preaching to the resident slaves, but soon found himself navigating ethical waters arguably more treacherous than the archipelago's shipwreck-filled coastline. He was happy for the chance to preach the gospel to them, but he quickly clarified it was a gospel message calibrated so as not to give them the least umbrage to behave imperiously to their masters. Possibly betraying a measure of internal dissonance at this unevenly applied good news, he continued, if ever a minister in preaching needs the wisdom of the serpent to be joined with the harmlessness of the dove, it must be when discoursing with Negroes. Perhaps strangely to our ears, the overwhelming impression is that for all of the shortcomings in Whitfield's theology and practice, America's slaves responded to him with overwhelming affection and 
On face value, his love for the slaves was genuine and invariably reciprocated. News of his death was met with genuine grief amongst the slave population. One of the most prominent eulogies came from the pen of an unlikely source, Phyllis Wheatley, a 17-year-old black servant and poet who had migrated to Boston from Africa nine years earlier. She memorialised Whitfield in a famous poem that, as a, as a British evangelist with a special affection for Americans in all of their diversity, especially and especially America's black slave population. But despite this effort to burnish Whitfield's reputation, there's little doubt that his reputation in the ensuing years has suffered, and I suspect rightly so, because of his engagement with slavery. In many ways, he shared in a racist culture that exploited the labour of a people considered to be inferior for its own commercial benefit, interpreting freedom to be a matter contingent upon circumstances of birth and race and economic expediency. And yet, if the president of the University of Pennsylvania in 2020 might well have raised an eyebrow at one biographer who described Whitfield as the first great friend of the American Negro, We've also seen that many of Whitfield's 18th century contemporaries, whether slave or free, might well have raised an eyebrow at the university's decision to pull down his statue. What I'm suggesting is this. There's little doubt that glossing over Whitfield's sins of, a, of commission and omission uh, about slavery runs the risk of presenting him in an unjustifiably flattering light. But the flip side is also true that recasting his legacy exclusively in terms of a pro-slavery agenda in order to cancel his memory entirely is anachronistic. What lessons are there for us? Well, Whitfield's specks and blind spots, culpable blind spots, clearly visible with the benefit of three centuries worth of uh, hindsight, undoubtedly serve as a cautionary tale of the dangers of complicity with a prevailing culture's fallenness. But lest we be tempted to pass hasty and self-righteous judgment upon him, his example also reminds us of how susceptible we are to harbouring planks in our own spiritual eyes, uh, planks that threaten to impair the clarity of our own moral vision. Managing to successfully elude the university's censure was one-time slave owner Benjamin Franklin on the grounds that in contrast to Whitfield, uh, Franklin changed course in his life and went on to become a leading abolitionist. Uh, naturally, this raises several final, if ultimately unanswerable, questions. Might Whitfield have embraced the abolitionist cause if he lived to experience that initial wave of anti-slavery activism? that increasingly began to capture the evangelical community's hearts and minds from the mid-1770s onwards. Remember, Whitfield, he's already been dead for five years by this point. Might he have chosen to emancipate the 75 slaves still residing at the Bethesda Orphanage at the time of his death, instead of bequeathing them to Selina, Count, uh, Countess of Huntington? Might he have followed in fellow revivalist John Wesley's footsteps who in 1791, fully two decades after Whitfield's death, famously urged the evangelical parliamentarian William Wilberforce to pursue the end of slavery, that execrable villainy, which is the scandal of religion, of England, and of human nature. Of course, as illuminating as answers to these questions would be, uh, they remain tantalizingly out of reach. And so rather than hypothesising, perhaps there's wisdom in casting all speculation aside and opting for the approach that Whitfield himself took in penning his own intended epigraph. Quote, I am content to wait for the day of judgment, for the clearing up of my character. And after I am dead, I desire no other epitaph than this. Here lies G.W. What sort of a man he was, the great day will discover. We've got some time for questions, Bernard.
Yes. Yes. He was. Lots of times. So the world that he inhabited, slavery was just, it was everywhere. You couldn't be an inhabitant of the British Empire and especially do as much travel as he was doing. So he was backwards and forwards across the Atlantic more than just about anyone. So he made 13 crossings. Extraordinary. Um, and everywhere he went throughout that world, that very British world, uh, revolution hadn't happened at that stage. It wasn't... Uh, the American colonies still saw themselves as being very much British, part of that extended empire. Everywhere he went, slavery was part of the fabric of that society. So again, I say all that not to excuse him or exonerate him, but it was the air that he was breathing. Um, it was um, s s seemingly so entrenched as to be unchallengeable and I suspect that's what drove him to see this as an institution that was flawed but an institution that could be redeemed I don't think it ever crossed his mind that it could be an institution that could be overthrown in a way that evangelicals soon after his death began to see as a possibility Oh, he did. He did. So he was an Anglican, but he wore his Anglicanness really lightly. So he was much more likely to describe himself as a presbyter at large. So he tried to um, anything that threatened to limit his mobility, so his spatial mobility or his denominational mobility, he chafed against. Uh, he was all about trying to reach as many people as he possibly could with the gospel. And if that meant um, not so much being an interdenominational preacher as much as a transdenominational preacher, so bypassing denominations altogether. Um, we've all heard of Billy Graham, I suspect. So he was, he was the, the proto-Billy Graham um, celebrity preacher, the first evangelical celebrity preacher. Um, bringing that same entrepreneurial spirit, um, uh, the emphasis on parachurch ministries, um, largely unaccountable in many ways. So he was pulled up by folks who are otherwise um, really impressed with his, the way in which he preached the gospel, but really sceptical of the way in which he went about it without any sort of denominational accountability. Um, whenever Whitfield was challenged on that, He'd say, no, 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 I've been given, I've been given a license to go and raise money for my Bethesda orphanage. And so whenever I preach, I'm taking in collections that are going to the Bethesda orphanage. That was his kind of get out of jail free card as he gallivanted around the transatlantic world. Yeah. Baxter. Um, so he grew up in England. Yes. Yeah, uh, yes, so he was backwards and forwards a lot um, and trying to run this orphanage from afar, but it was hard. Uh, economically, it was, it, uh, a lot of money went, went missing or was just squandered, poorly used in his absence. So he wasn't there on the ground to be able to oversee stuff going on with the orphanage. So it was a bit of a, it was just a black hole of money. Sometimes he preached in buildings, but he much preferred preaching outdoors. You could uh, preach to a whole lot more people outdoors than you could in a church building. Um, so oftentimes he'd be denied access to churches because of the gospel that he was preaching. These, are, these were not gospel-minded churches. Um, so he rejoiced in that. That was uh, God's providence. Um, uh, 
I suspect so. Yeah. It's the nature of blind spots, isn't it? It's hard to see them in ourselves, easier to see them in others. Yes. You, you, you can see that tension in Whitfield. Is he, uh, uh, is he in favour of slavery for financial reasons or is he in favour of it because it affords him opportunities to evangelise this segment of society that's been largely overlooked by other Christians? Um, it, like, it, yes, seems to be the, the answer to that question. But both of those things are vying for supremacy. And uh, I suspect not even he could tell which one was paramount, the paramount motivator for him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so he looks at examples, those descriptions of slavery in the New Testament. Yeah, right? He looks at Ephesians, he looks at Philemon. Uh, he sees passages there and he sees these descriptions of slavery. And it, it doesn't seem to me as though the Bible is overturning this practice. Um, and so he interprets it through his own lens, and he's living, you know, living in a culture where slavery is everywhere. Oh, slavery is everywhere in the New Testament as well. I guess it must just be part of the fabric of human existence. And so I'm going to try and redeem it, but not overthrow it. Yeah. Bernard, we're done. We're done. Grab a cuppa, grab a for questions, 10 minutes. Great. Ourselves. Yep. We have some out there. I think Dan's looking after the sale of these. Yep. So 10 dead guys you should know, 10 dead gals you should know, and 10 dead guys you should know. Um, so I've written these with a couple of my colleagues at SNBC. And they are $50 each. And I think Dan has the little um, thingamy. Yep. Yep. Wonderful. All right. Thanks.